Hey, everybody, and welcome to The Seventh Rule with Sirach Lofton. Hello, hello. My name is Ryan T. Husk, and we are joined today with the one and only Mark A. Altman. How are you today? I am delightful. Just living the life in quarantine. What can I say? <laughs> <laughs> Writer, producer, uh, free enterprise. You wrote a couple of books called The, uh, the Oral History of the First uh, 50 Years of Star Trek, right? That's right. Where should we start? Let's talk about free enterprise. I feel like that was the first one, right? I'm sorry, what did you say, Ryan? Start with uh, free enterprise. I feel like that was the first big Star Trek related thing that uh, you did. What was the uh, inspiration behind that? Well, you know, I mean, free enterprise it was my first feature. It was, uh, you know, I was dying to get out of journalism and uh, we did free enterprise. Uh, it was, you know, a film about... Uh, two Star Trek fans who meet their idol, William Shatner, and find out he's more screwed up than they are, which is you know, kind of what we, <laughs> we make in the movie. It was a really remarkable experience because, of course, when we went to Bill with the script and we had the financing and everything ready to go, um, you know, Bill didn't want to do the movie. And it was really funny because nobody could understand, like, why doesn't he want to do the film? It was kind of uh, very reverential, uh, like played against Sam, the way you know Woody Allen worshipped. Humphrey Bogart. It was about these guys who like looked up to Bill Shatner. He was, you know, and they learned all these vital life lessons from him. And uh, I remember we get the call very vividly, uh, and uh, our assistant says, "Oh, Bill Shatner's on the phone. William Shatner's on the phone." And we thought it was one of our friends, you know, fucking with us basically. And we pick up. <laughs> it's like this is Bill Shatner, and we're like, "Yeah, Bill." He goes, "I keep getting these letters and these things from my agent and stuff about you wanting to be this movie." I'm not interested. I'm not doing your film. I'm like, why are you calling? <laughs> <laughs> so he goes on. He tells, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a very, uh, I'm a very screwed up guy. I'm, I'm not a guy who, who's a god or a guru. And uh, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm embarrassed to sign autographs. So uh, I don't like the fact that you know you have me as like this, this guy that these guys worship. And uh, so I just want to let you know I'm not doing your movie. And I'm like, oh really? <laughs> what is it, you know, how could we convince you, you know, maybe to uh, change your mind? And he says, well, nothing. And then he goes, well, maybe there's one thing. And then we kind of knew we had him. Mm -hmm. And he's like, uh, you know, maybe if I was a screwed up guy, that's something I'd be interested in playing. And we're like, well, what, you know, what kind of problems does Bill Shatner have? He goes, girls. <laughs> <laughs> 20 minutes, a half hour. He's like, call me Bill. And we're Bill this, Bill that. About a half hour goes by. And he goes, okay, you guys got your marching orders. I'll read the rewrite. I'm not saying I'm going to do it. I probably won't. But, uh, but uh, you know, I'll, I'll look forward to seeing it. We're like, that sounds great, Bill. He says, now you can call me Mr. Shat. We're like, let me put that in the script. Uh, and, and we wrote the script. And the script uh, came out, um, you know, he, he loved it. Said he was going to do the movie, which was nice. Because we had already rewritten it for, like, uh, Malcolm McDowell. <laughs> You know, we had okay. backup plans uh, in case he didn't uh, want to do the movie. He committed, and obviously, it was a uh, fantastic experience. Bill was Bill was great. Movie, um, you know, came out theatrically the same week as The Phantom Menace, and uh, you know, it didn't. It wasn't a huge hit, but it became a big cult film that's beloved, mm -hmm. and uh, it was a really auspicious beginning to. Uh, uh, to my career of film and TV. It's, it's a very fond memory for me. Of course, we ended up going to Cannes with the film, uh, and uh, that was great, and, and Bill flew on the Concord. I think we were in steerage. It was like Titanic. And uh, so um, he ended up giving one of the outfits he wore in the movie to uh, Planet Hollywood Cannes, and mm -hmm. uh, it was really the first time we got to travel the world, which brings me to my Aaron Eisenberg story. Ooh, already, all right. All right it to but this is up very nicely so when we were on our free enterprise tour and traveling the world and boldly going i mean spain and can and 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 and, and uh, all over it was it was really fantastic we were invited as guests rob the director and, and myself the writer producer to um uh go to a convention in paris and we'd been doing a lot of conventions and stuff and i'd been doing them before from my journalism career because the los angeles times uh, called me the world's foremost Trek expert, and that somehow stuck, for better or for worse. And um, and so we ended up going to Paris. And other guests were Rod Roddenberry, Max Grudenchik, and Aaron Eisenberg. So this is the time 
we all met. So we go to Paris and we're all like Americans in Paris. It was like, we're all super, we're going to a Star Trek convention in Paris. We're like, well, this will be interesting to see if Star Trek fans are the same the world over. They are, by the way. And uh, we all just immediately, you know, like, it's like summer camp because you're, 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 you're together far away. None of us knew each other. It's where I met Rod for the first time. We became good friends and I knew Max, but I didn't know Aaron. And we beca- we all became fast friends that weekend. And the, the operative word, the only word we knew in French pretty much other than adieu was um, sacre bleu. Aaron <laughs> was sacre bleu. <laughs> car windows. I remember he, sacre bleu. And we were just having there it. Time and we ended up. I think we pissed off the people who organized the convention because they were <laughs> and like very like they expected us to like hang out and do all this stuff. But we just wanted to go and like see Paris. And so we ended up, I guess, befriending not the cool kids, like the AV department. There was this one girl who dressed up like Dax and a couple of other um, people, and they were really cool. And we're like, what are the cool things we could do? in Paris, that would be fun. And they want to take us to the catacombs and you know, go to all the clubs and we're like, so it was Aaron and me and Max, who of course was the curmudgeon, right? Who was like, I want to go home, I just, you know, and, uh, and, um, and, and Rod and uh, we would go and uh, just had the greatest time. But it was funny because we left right from the convention. So this girl who was dressed as Dax had the costume on. So everywhere we went in Paris, she was like dressed as Dax and, and everybody was like, who, what? Who are you? Why are you dressed like that? <laughs> um, it was so funny because the last night, uh, you know, it was like we just had the greatest time and we're like, oh, my God, we're going to have to go home tomorrow. I said, oh, but you're going to love tomorrow. We're doing this really special event at the end of the convention. It's, it's, you guys are going to have the greatest time. I'm like, what is it? We're having the, the dinner, the final dinner at um, Planet Hollywood. Now, that could not have been worse. We're all like, we're in France the greatest food in the world, the greatest every wine, women, and song. We're like, this is fantastic. And they're having this thing at Planet Hollywood, you know, and it's like, oh, please, no. But uh, we ended up just walking around Paris that whole night and just we went to the clubs and we had the greatest time. And it was this really special weekend. And every time that I've seen, you know, that I see Aaron after that, the first thing he would always say, Sacre Bleu! Oh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Last time that I saw him was at Comic Con last summer, um, and you know we we saw each other. Of course, I got the greeted soccer blue, and we're like hanging out because I was doing press for Pandora, my CW show, and he was there to promote something. And we were just like getting pulled by our publicists in two different directions. And we're like, we got to get together. It's been too long. I hadn't seen him in a while. We're like, yeah, we totally do. And I, you know, we've both been remiss about making plans. I said, well, I, I promise I'll be better about, and then, you know, of course he passed away and it was just uh, horrible for, for everyone. And I mean, you know, uh, I just, uh, I have such fond memories of his joy de vivre. I learned another French word and <laughs> just his energy and his laughter, which was so infectious. And it was just this really special week in weekend in, uh, Midnight in Paris, you know, weekend in in France that I'll always treasure, and uh, you know, never forget that laughter and that the you know, just just a remarkable guy. So everyone has, you know, this is just a tiny little story compared to you know everyone who knew him so well. But uh, just a remarkable guy, and that's why when you guys contacted me about being on the show, I really wanted to do it because mm. I just loved Aaron like everyone did, and uh, just uh, such a fond memory of that time. And we were. We're all much younger and much more single at the time, and it was a great weekend. It was a really good weekend. Sounds amazing. Yeah. Hey, uh, two quick questions. Sirak, does that sound like Aaron at all beating the Sacre Bleu joke to death or no? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> he was very good at beating it all the way up. We could totally <laughs> picture him doing it. <laughs> yeah, I can could, I could see it right away as yeah, soon and- as you said it. And the other, uh, I, yeah, we could actually hear him in, in his voice. Go, Sacre bleu. Uh, also, uh, Mark, one follow-up question. Because Rod was, I think, already with Heidi. So he, he, he you know, we, I mean, uh, Rod was great. We had a great time. And I, you know, I knew him a little bit, but really knew him a lot better after that. But, but it was like Aaron and me and Rob, we were just like all over. And then Max was getting dragged along and just like, eh. <laughs> <laughs> you know? That also sounds right. 
<laughs> yeah, that does sound pretty accurate. Uh, the other, the other quick question, Mark, is uh, you, you kind of glazed over the uh, the lady in the Jadzia Dax cosplay. When everybody's wondering, are we talking about her in the science uniform? Is it on the the Riza uniform? What what was she wearing? What was the cosplay? <laughs> It was the science uniform, but I, you know, she, she looked a little like Terry. So, I mean, she had, uh, uh, you know, and, 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 and she was very like demure and I don't know how great her English was, but she was super nice. And, and they were so good, you know, because we've always said the takeaway from Star Trek, you know, the joke is, uh, you know, get out of your parents' basement, the, the Shatner routine and Saturday Night Live. But we always felt like the real message of Star Trek is to boldly go, Right. And where do you boldly go? Not all of us are Elon Musk. We're not all going to space. So it's like, <laughs> see the world, befriend other people, you know, um, haven't, you know, obviously um, appreciate science and logic and live in the real world and treat everyone equally and, 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 and live life passionately. And so, you know, going to Paris when we were on this whole thing, it was like part of like seeing the world and sort of spreading our love of Star Trek, um, you know, around, around the world. And it was great because they saw it the same way because there's such important messages that I think are a takeaway for all of us from, you know, our love of Star Trek, you know, which is to extol the value of science, you know, to appreciate diversity. You know, Star Trek at its heart is a show with very progressive social values, which is why, you know, much to some of our listeners' chagrin, I always am on my soapbox on Inglorious Trexper saying, I don't understand how, you know, people like Stephen Miller in the Trump administration are huge Star Trek fans or Ted Cruz, mm-hmm. because apparently they missed everything about Star Trek that was important. And just like the phasers and the ships fighting, because the values of Star Trek in no way correspond to what they believe. And it, it makes me nuts, you know, um, because that's not what Star Trek's about, you know. Um, and I think that's something that Star Trek taps into. I mean, it also, Star Trek more than anything, is not about the fear of the other or about xenophobia. And it's mm. about the government's ability to do great good. You know, the Federation is as big government as you can get. And, um, you know, we're not afraid of other cultures. I mean, you go back to the original Star Trek when Kirk fights the Gorn, you know, even though they appear to be our enemy and this horrible creature, you know, we realize that they have a perspective as well that's worth sharing. So um, for us going to France, like, we sort of like, this was, our Star Trek, you know, this was trekking. And and when we did Free Enterprise, we hadn't really, I mean, subsequently I've traveled the world a lot, you know, uh, you know, my TV show shoots in Europe. So I've been, you know, around the world a lot, but at the time I'd never even left the country other than going to Canada and Mexico. So when we went to the Sidious Film Festival in Spain, that was remarkable. And then to go to Paris and go to Cannes and go all these places, you know, to me it was, and I know to Rob as well, that was a really remarkable experience and meet so many great people. Yeah. Um, there's so, you, you say so many things. I, I, there's like 10 follow-up things I want to jump on. It's all so interesting. <laughs> I like it. I don't know where to start with it all. Um, but one thing I really wanted to touch on is something you, you just mentioned, which was what Star Trek is best at, I think, other than other than metaphor, you know, they always show the, the great analogies and metaphors, but is showing the other person's perspective or the other side's perspective is they're always like, you know, in every episode we watch, you're right. It's, it's never us versus them. They always are willing to demonstrate, Hey, what if it, what if, what is it like? What if you were that Gorn or what if you were that person? You know, they always show that perspective, uh, which is basically, I don't know if there's necessarily a term for it, but it's basically the opposite of othering, you know, it's showing that we all have, you know, interests and, and our perspectives and our points of view. And uh, Sirak and I right now are, are deep into season three of Deep Space Nine. And almost every episode has some kind of demonstration of compassion or of further understanding or of seeing, you know, the other alien or whatever's point of view, like the one that yeah. we're going to be doing later today. Is this, way, is this a, your first time looking at these uh, since you shot them, Sirak? I mean, have you watched the show since the late nineties, I mean, or, or, or is it? Yeah, no, this is my first time watching any of the shows actually, except for some of the big ones that were famous and more popular, right? Like the, like the visitor or far beyond the stars. But, um, I haven't watched any of these episodes. I remember some of the scripts, um, 
for example, we'll be reviewing an episode later today that I get my first girlfriend in, and I remember the script. I remember the experience of being nervous about meeting her, mm-hmm. um, and you know, and and, and what, whatever that would bring the kissing scenes and things of that nature. So uh, I was <laughs> I was excited, nervous, all of that emotional stuff getting ready for this particular one. But one thing that jumped out at me that you did say, Mark, was you were talking about how we don't really, we're not all Elon Musk, so we don't have the opportunity to explore the galaxy in our personal space rockets. But we do have an opportunity to explore uh, Earth and the world we live in. And instead of meeting alien races, we meet different cultures. And I think that's what, one of the things that you were talking about, having a full Trek experience with meeting, you know, the, being immersed in the French culture and in France and, you know, just seeing new places and, and new people. And I think that's one of the things that I enjoy a lot about doing these conventions. It is, it is exactly the Trek experience, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, I, you know, it was fr- when we... F- our, the premiere Free Enterprise was in the Sigis Film Festival, which is like the can of genre film in, in Spain, in Barcelona, Spain. And I remember we were concerned because our movie was a comedy and they show it uh, subtitled in Catalan and in Spanish and in you know, a bunch of different languages. I was like, is this going to play? Like, are they going to get it? I mean, it was a big concern of ours. And, you know, fortunately, it, w- it went over really, really well. And I think they had to add a second show. Um, but that was so cool. And we realized like Star Trek fans, even if you know we come from completely different cultures, we all have this thing that is Star Trek in common that unites us. And you know, I think, you know, we talked about obviously politically, there is a thread that I think unites us, but there's also Star Trek at its heart is about family. I mean, and never more so I you know, we talked about the original show as a family, um, but of course you know, in your case, you, you literally were a family with your, 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 your dad, Cisco in Deep Space Nine. And I think that's something that people just adore about Star Trek. And when a Star Trek show works, like the original or like Deep Space Nine, uh, you know, or Next Gen, it's because, you know, at its heart, it's really a great family drama. Because even when these people fight and they don't get along, they still love each other. And that's why I never understood why people would complain, oh, Deep Space Nine is too dark, because it was never because these people would like sacrifice their lives for each other, which was what was so great about the original Star Trek, as much as Spock and McCoy would hurl witty Bon Mots at each other, they clearly loved each other in their own way. And that was what was true of, of Deep Space Nine as well, which is probably why, you know, when people ask me, in fact, my son asked me this, our internet was down last week and he's a big Star Wars guy. He's, he's, he's 11 years old. Kate, you know, he's been fascinated by my love of Star Trek particularly because I think he wants my action figures and the ships and everything. And <laughs> he had you know, watched a couple episodes. He was a big fan of the cage, but because the internet was down, we ended up watching a bunch of Star Treks this weekend and he watched trials and tribulations. He'd never seen, um, deep space nine. And great episode. Loved it. And I know Ira says, Oh, that's not a great example of a great deep space nine because it's really an episode of the original. It's not really deep space nine, but it exposed him to kind of the characters. And he said, so what's your order? You know, like, you know, she's big on the lists. And I said, <laughs> and he says, yeah, I know the original's your favorite. He says, but what's your second? I said, deep space nine is my close, you know, second. And then next generation is probably a close third. And, uh, and so, um, you know, Mark, he, I'm sorry, but, uh, we got to hear the end of this list. You can't, no, you yeah. can't tease us like that. <laughs> you got <laughs> him, but you know, here's the thing. You know, you do this podcast in Glorious Trexperts. And, uh, and the thing about that is we, we, we decided when we went in, it was going to be about celebrating what we love and trying not to bag. It was very easy for me to go negative and go sarcastic. But I didn't want to do that because with the internet, there's so much of that. And during the, the rule of this current administration, I just don't want to dwell on the negative. And mm. the reality is a Star Trek show that I hate. And let, there are shows that I don't like quite a bit but i it doesn't behoove me to to you know to bag on them you know to you know to, I, it's like it's, it's somebody's favorite star trek show and i don't want right. a necessarily situation like i could easily tell you why it's awful but i don't want to because like let them love what they love you know and mm-hmm. and you know it doesn't it, it doesn't make me feel better to crap all over somebody's star trek show that they love um 
you know? And so I'd rather just celebrate the things that we really love about Star Trek. And we've managed to do that now for like three freaking years. And I'd really only planned on doing it for a little while because I had some time in my schedule to a chance to get together with uh, friends and um, promote the books. <laughs> and, but we had so much fun. And then we built this huge audience who, who, you know, talk, who really like loved the show and lived for the, the show coming out every Saturday that, you know, I feel like Michael Corleone, I keep trying to get out, but they pulled me back in. <laughs> I can't leave. And even when, because we record in the studio, because we do the video podcast at the same time, we do the audio that are up on the electric now uh, streaming. Uh, channel um, because I partnered with Dean Devlin to do it and uh, and now we're doing it through Zoom because like people like we couldn't take a hiatus because people like oh you know you're still going to have shows every week and it's crazy because it's just become this huge thing and you know finding the time is you know more and more challenging because I you know I was in Europe three you know two months ago to start pre-production on the second season of Pandora and then I had a come back because of the quarantine we had to shut down obviously because of the pandemic and you know uh now i have to go go back because we're going to start a production at the end of you know uh june and my big worry is do we have enough episodes of inglorious trexperts to last until i get back you know in in, in september and it's like right. this podcasting it's like addictive it's crazy <laughs> it is addictive. you start doing that math you know that calendar math yeah yeah, but I just wanted to echo the sentiments uh, you made uh, real quickly about really focusing on the positive and talking about the things you love, because even if you're not specifically saying, I hate this, just the fact that it's at the bottom of your list is going to hurt some people's feelings. It's going to upset some people. So whenever people say, make a list of your favorite series, that's actually what I do too. I give them the top three and I say, and then everything else is below that. And then that way, I'm not bugging anybody. Nobody's yelling at me. They might question my top three series, uh, but at least I'm not offending anybody. Like, I, look, I'll get, I'll get, and you know, if somebody wants to tell me why they hate the original or hate Deep Space Nine, you know, look, I'll, then I'll, I'll give it to them. And we did a one episode where we, we sort of uh, did, you know, we did a search of where we, we everything is wrong with Star Trek Three, but we did it with love, you know, because that's yeah, and 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 and. Uh, and it's super fun. And we never said, oh, just because we think it's bad doesn't mean you should not like it or not watch it. Because, you know, we still watch it all the time. It's just terrible. Um, but, it, uh, but it was a fun show to do. And part of it was, you know, we were able to talk about why, you know, sort of a lot of the reasons why it doesn't work. And if we do something like why we don't love, like, Star Trek 2000. We'll make sure to balance it with somebody like Scott Mance, who will talk about why he's passionate about it, why he loves it. Um, you know, it's like I'm trying to do a show about the politics of Star Trek, where I have somebody from the Young Turks who's going to talk about the progressive, progressive vision of Star Trek. I'm having a really difficult time finding a conservative to take the opposing, the 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 opposite uh, perspective. And I want to get somebody who's credible, so we can have a real argument rather than just have it be, mm. you know, us talking. And particularly since I know Darren. Of a my co-host is of a different political stripe than I am, and I want to make sure it's not just a, you know, I want it to, to be without a, getting too deep into politics. I'm just curious, who from the Young Turks was it? It's a guy named Jonathan Larson. He's one of the producers over there. So um, and uh, he's terrific, and and he's going to um, so so you know we put that together because you know I'm always thinking you're always putting really good shows together. I mean, we got a show coming up, which I'm really proud of. We got um, Andre Richardson who. Um, was Jean Kuhn's uh, assistant. She was the first African-American secretary assistant on the Desilu lot back in the mid 60s. And she came to work wow. for Jean Kuhn and his amazing, great firsthand stories about working with Jean, who is, you know, was the producer on Star Trek from middle of first season, you know, to the, almost the end of second season. And is really the secret sauce of Star Trek, you know, with the forgotten Jean. And there are very few people <laughs> alive who knew him. And uh, so she has incredible stories. Plus, she's remarkable because she was like best friends with Martin Luther King and Malcolm X and Karenga. And it's like, she's fantastic. And, you know, she started towards the end of the interview saying, well, I'm writing a book. And so I'm going to save this for the book. I'm like, don't save it for the book. You're like 87 years old. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and tell, uh, tell us some of these stories quick. So it was. <laughs> 
really good. And we try to balance the episode like where we're doing an episode like Academy of the Overrated, where we talk about like the most overrated Star Trek episodes versus, um, uh, you know, the interviews. So, you know, one week we'll have Vance and Mount on, and then one week we'll have, you know, Michael Dorn on, and then another week it'll be like, uh, you know, the best captain's episodes or something. And, you know, that brings me back to what you were saying about like, you know, do you go past the, the, the three, the, the, the three you like and start talking about the ones you don't. And I used to be very, I used to be very snarky about Voyager, particularly when it was on. Not a fan, right? And, um, and at, at one point when I was doing research for 50 Year Mission, we talked to a girl, and she, woman, and she talked about how Captain Janeway was such a huge influence on her um, to become a scientist. Like she worked at NASA or JPL, and, and mm -hmm. how much this uh, Janeway meant to her as a woman, as a role model. And it, it kind of like, I kind of realized I was being a bit of a dick by bagging on Voyager all the time, because I realized how important Voyager was, not only to her, but a lot of other people. And so since then, I tried to see the good in Voyager, and I've really made a point in like going back and watching a lot of episodes. And I found a lot of episodes I had never seen that I actually did enjoy. And um, we tried to uh, spotlight it on the show. Uh, we just did a 25th anniversary episode with Brian Fuller. So, you know, it's still never going to be one of my favorite Star Trek episodes, but I tried to like look at it through their eyes. And, um, you know, in the way that Captain Kirk was a role model to me growing up, you know, he was the man. Right. The loyalty of his crew, the respect of his friends, and a green girl on every planet, you know, she had something in Janeway that meant something to her. And there were a lot of other women and men that that were inspired by Janeway. You know, to me, she was always Kate Hepburn. I could never get Kate Hepburn out of my head. But uh, but that's me. You know, uh, Sorok and I, as soon as you said, uh, I was never the biggest fan of uh Voyager, I think Sorok and I probably both imagined Aaron leaning in going, go on. <laughs> Tell me more. Uh, I mean, it's, so, it's, it's, and I mean, I have to say, even, I, I, this is embarrassing, but I mean, I've watched a couple of Enterprises I'd never seen over this lockdown. And that's a show that I never had any great affinity for. But I there actually watched quite a couple episodes now um, that I found quite entertaining, you know, that I liked that I had a new appreciation for it. Again, I, it's not my top three, but it was it's my top three. Is it? Okay. Well, there you go. To each their own. And, shocking. Uh, but it, you know, <laughs> it, you know, I, I, I found a new appreciation for it. I discovered a new appreciation for, for it, particularly, you know, Manny Cotto's for fourth season and mm -hmm. uh, some, yeah. some, you know, some of the, some of the episodes that I hadn't, hadn't seen. So, uh, but I don't know why I've been watching a lot of Star Trek over the um, quarantine. I guess I need something that I don't have to think. I don't know. It's just, um, I don't know. I've just been watching a lot of Star Trek. It's kind of interesting. Um, also, because when we do these shows on the shows that I'm not as well versed in, um, I kind of like to be knowledgeable. So I go back and, and watch them. I mean, I did that. The last time I did that was when I was doing research for the book. Because when we wrote that, it came out for the 50th anniversary, the first one. Um, and I, you know, co-wrote it with a gross. And I said, let me do the Enterprise chapter. And he said, why well, do you want to do that? I said, because I don't really know much about that show. Because by then, I, I was no longer a journalist. I was making movies and TV. So I didn't know much about it. So I said, it'll be interesting for me. Because, I, you know, it'll be more of like Columbo. I'll be like a detective. And I'll get to talk to all these people I've never talked to before. And it, it'll be interesting. And it was. And it was fascinating. I mean, it, the whole process of writing about Enterprise was really interesting to me. Although not as interesting as writing about Galactica 1980 in the Galactica book, but that's a whole nother story. Hey, so we only have a few minutes left. And by the way, uh, before I get to this uh, last question here, Sirach, what do you think? If we're making a list, is this top three easiest interviews we've ever done or what? Oh, man, this is great. I've <laughs> this actually, is so fun. <laughs> I've actually had a cardboard cut out of me in my place. <laughs> <laughs> wasn't really me sitting here. This no, is I great. Think, I think Mark, I think you're the greatest, right? We got seriously. Like, we got to fill up our up till September. So you guys, <laughs> <laughs> this is so much fun. It's like story time with Mark. It's so easy. I love it. It's, it's easy. You know, so, it, it, we're celebrating the love, like the Ewok said, right? We so, love. We love Star Trek. I mean, we love it because you're still getting residuals for it, right? So that's. <laughs> Because you know it's it's great. You like Enterprise. I love the original. You know, there you go. <laughs> no, I think the best part is that we don't have to ask any questions. It's almost like I just it's just I 
you answer every question I have before I get a chance to answer. And Ask everything he question. says is more interesting than what we would have asked anyway, right? <laughs> exactly. So I'm like, just, just keep going. I hadn't even, I had no idea there were conventions in Paris, actually. You just like opened my eyes just on that alone. The <laughs> boat. <laughs> Royale with cheese. <laughs> yeah. With- El Royale with cheese. I go back. I, I, you know, it's, it's, mm, I'm hoping love it. the show on the CW, Pandora, which is sort of Star Trek ish, you know, it's how do you do a show in Europe? I don't, I don't, I didn't know they do that. The reason is, is, is we don't have a huge budget, so we, we shouldn't Sophia and, uh, for CW. And, um, and, and so because it's, they, we can do a lot more set construction there. Uh, um, we were able to do, and plus when we got picked up last year for the first season, we were picked up in February. We had to start shooting in April and we were on the air in July, which was insane. It's amazing we were able to show anything other than a test pattern. So I'm really excited <laughs> for the second season because we had a lot more time. We were able to build a lot more. There's a lot more in space. Um, and uh, so it's, 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 really, it's really cool. But um, yeah, I'm shooting in Europe. It's interesting because I mean, I remember I, I was directing the finale and this guy comes up to me, our prop master, and he's holding this like really ominous, scary looking device. You know, it looks like a torture device. And he goes, is this the avuncular disposition? I'm like, what are you talking about? He goes, <laughs> he says, the character drops his avuncular disposition. And I started laughing. He said, why are you laughing? I said, it's not a weapon. It's a personality thing. It's like, you from being really <laughs> I said, "Avuncular <laughs> disposition," <laughs> and it, it was all uh, a joke on set. I said, "I need, I need the avuncular disposition." <laughs> oh man! Just don't put crestfallen in there. They'll be like, "Where's the toothpaste?" Sorry, that sucked. <laughs> so um, the challenge of shooting somewhere where English isn't a first language, um, but uh, but but it's great. We you know great crew, and we cast a lot out of the UK. I mean, one of the fun things for me was you know we tr- we cast some quote unquote genre luminary. So, you know, we brought Aaron Gray down to, to play a captain and, you know, cool. we in a, a space suit that was very similar to what you wore in Buck Rogers. And, uh, and she was just delightful and, um, and, and loved having her. And she said, she said, she said, thank you because I finally got to be a captain after all these years. And she was a sweetheart. And, uh, you know, we continue we had Jeff Combs came down. I mean, that was great. This is a funny story. I know you got to go. Jeff Combs is on our podcast a couple of weeks before I leave to go back in the middle of shooting. And she's pheno- you know, phenomenal, as you all know, all too well, and you know, so versatile. And we ended up, he came early, and normally we take lunch at Shake Shack because it's near our studio and where we record. And so he came with us and we were all bullshit and having a great time. And it came up, I'm doing the show in Sophia. And so oh, I, I, I was there for one of his films that he shot. I'd love to go back at some point. Well, the role, comes up i guess one of the actors fell out or we were scheduling problems so i'm like oh you know it'd be great for this jeff combs so we mm-hmm. called for the casting director calls up jeff do you want to do the show and you know shooting in like two weeks and so and he says yes so as a result of our podcast you know like a month later jeff combs is flying out to sophia to do the show and he was fantastic and it was great so um we had a bunch of people like Manu Bennett and, you know, uh, mm-hmm. a couple of Bond. I had Mariam Diabo. I just done the Bond book and uh, it was a sort of a James Bondy kind of episode. So we had Mariam Diabo from The Living Daylights on the show, which was uh, which was really fun because, you know, got to talk James Bond for a while. I mean, that's the, that's the real reason I make movies and TV, just the bullshit about the stuff I love. It was like when I was doing Agent X, I sit there with Sharon Stone and we just talk about, you know, all the movies you did and, uh, you know, how great great you know just amazing stories about uh so it's 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 uh it's all good i mean that's what the podcast is you know it's just bullshit totally. or you just bs about stuff that you're interested in oh we know about bullshitting right sir <laughs> <laughs> hey uh so we do have to run but before we go i want to make sure to mention this incredible uh book or two books that you wrote uh what's cool about it is that the title of the book is also the elevator pitch, right? I mean, the title is The 50-Year Mission, The Complete, Uncensored, Unauthorized Oral History of the Star Trek Volume 1, The First 25 Years. Yeah, and then the second one, shockingly, is the next one. <laughs> yeah. goes through <laughs> the first one, and then the next one is Next Generation through uh, Enterprise. And That's awesome. 
it doesn't include the new shows. So we'll definitely include uh, where to get that in, in a link in the uh, description box below for everybody to check that out. Video. Oh, <laughs> you know, so. say that again. Or, Sorry. Hardcover. Yeah. And the, oh, the paperback. I can't even keep track. I, I just, you know, same thing. I was like, oh, I get my uh, my my back end uh, checks on that. I'm like, okay, great. Oh, it came out of paperback. Oh, yeah, it sure did. And nice. uh, it's really great. I'm really, pr- now, in, in all seriousness, I'm very proud of those books. And of course, nobody does it better. Our James Bond book came out in February. Uh, that's also a terrific, um, uh, terrific as well. And then Inglorious Treks for it's every Saturday, wherever you listen to podcasts. Or you can watch the video versions by downloading the Electric Now app on, at your favorite app store. It's free. Awesome. Yeah. Great. Well, Mr. Mark A. Altman, Bye. thank you so Kill. much for joining us. Uh, it's been a great time. I feel like we yeah. uh, next time we need more time. There's so much good stuff. We'll do got. a volume two for the next 25 years. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> time is the fun <laughs> which we burn. Don't get me started on that movie. Yeah, I love it a pleasure and and really so great to be on aaron's podcast and get to talk about aaron because like i say just one of the many who has a great deal of love for him and and was just so sad when 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 this happened so uh uh, sacre bleu i was just gonna say so what you're trying to say is sacre bleu (laughs) (laughs) exactly thanks guys all right well thanks very much. much And uh, for Mr. Aaron Eisenberg and for everybody at home, thank you very much. Always remember the seventh.